yeah, you're right that that Christians and Christian business owners ought to have as part of their motivation to take care of creation, but that's not going to be enough to actually change practices in a sustainable way. And what I mean by sustainable is sustainable for you as a, as a person or as a business owner. I'd like to circle back again just a little bit to this uh, maybe self-imposed or, or often viewed as distinctions between Christianity and science. And I'd like to hear a little bit about your journey going through school and whether you you encountered that, where you as as a Christian, you're studying medical science, and I'm sure there were secular pressures and, and influences there. How did that affect you, and how as a Christian did you navigate being a Christian, approaching science, but then science kind of saying, or the, the secular attitude behind science is saying, you can't be that mm-hmm. and have science too. Mm-hmm. How did you deal with that? When I went to college, I was enthralled by the world of ideas. It was, it was intoxicating for me. And I felt the contrast of that with some of the people in my church who were uneducated in my mind. And... Um, so I went in thinking that, well, I actually went to college thinking that my biggest challenge was going to be evolution and I'm going to have to stand up for my beliefs. And then I got intoxicated by this world of ideas. These people are really smart. They're way smarter than I am, way smarter than anybody else I know. They know way more than I could ever hope to. And um, so that was disconcerting for me. At, at first. And in fact, the whole question of evolution threw me a bit to start with, um, because I went in thinking that evolution was a stupid idea and that only people who are actively trying to deny reality and actively trying to deny God's existence would believe in evolution. That's not the case. I also thought that I had some pretty good arguments in favor or against evolution. And so early in my career, actually, I think it was maybe third week of classes, I um, was, was walking beside my botany professor. We were going somewhere and, and I said, Dr. Hall, have you ever created life in the lab? So this was my, you know, this is, mm-hmm. this is my ace in the hole, right? They've never created life in the lab. So then my follow-up was going to be, so what makes us think that life could evolve by itself? Okay. Mm-hmm. Dr. Hall was, she'd been teaching for 40 years. She was um, very, very knowledgeable about the history of science and, and all of this. She kind of paused a little bit and she said, they've created amino acids, and and she started to tell me about um, the experiment in which they created some of the precursors of life using some of the uh, conditions that they think the early Earth might have had. And it wasn't so much that that she blew away my my question, um, because they hadn't created life in the lab, they created amino acids, and so I could have followed up there. But what I realized was that I was like a little bandy rooster standing up against a, a, an English mastiff. As in, I knew so little. Um, I knew nothing compared to her breadth of knowledge. And I wasn't going to be able to, I wasn't going to change her mind. I also knew she wasn't going to change mine. And so it, it, that was the end of the conversation. That shook me a bit. Because I realized that that my simple answers that I had that I had kind of imbibed weren't they weren't enough. That's not actually where science challenged my faith the most. Um, that was the only direct interaction I ever had with a professor in which I was trying to challenge evolution and they were trying to defend it. Okay, they just 
they approached the teaching science, they, they approached teaching science to me, just they, they taught it. And they weren't trying to make any arguments in any specific direction. You know, they, they never said, so therefore God couldn't exist or anything like that. They never directly attacked my faith. It didn't feel like there was an agenda. It felt like they right. were teaching facts and they right. weren't, weren't trying to push right. one viewpoint. Or so, so I was expecting this proselytizing mm -hmm. um, and I was expecting them to, to, to be constantly making snide remarks about young earth creationism and never, not once. But I still almost lost my faith. Um, and what it actually was um, had very little to do with the evolution debate. It had a lot more to do with an approach to life. Um, and and so, so when I talk to my students about going to college, I'm very open with them about the dangers that they're going to face. And the danger is not so much that your beliefs will be challenged. They will be. It's that your way of thinking, so I live in an enchanted world, okay? The, God exists, angels exist, the spirits are around us. This is an enchanted world. Scientists often don't, okay? Now, I shouldn't say scientists, I should say strictly naturalistic scientists do not live in an enchanted world. They take the approach that all that exists is the physical universe. Um, Carl Sagan said, um, all that is is the cosmos, all that ever was the cosmos, all that ever will be the cosmos. And by that, he means the physical cosmos. And that approach to life, always, always, the first thing you ask is what's the physical explanation for whatever phenomenon you see. I started to imbibe that. And I started to, I started to recognize that my first approach was not to go to God for anything, but to, um, to seek a scientific explanation to seek um, physical evidences and so on. I recognized that I was, I was slowly but surely losing my dependence on God and in so doing, losing my faith in Him. And so that's why I took some time off um, and actually came here to Faith Builders for a winter term and did some other things that, that kind of regrounded me. And in the process, I started teaching. And I, I think back about where I was as a person when I started teaching, and I shudder because I really wasn't ready. But, um, but, but looking back, it's, it's the grace of God that kept me in his fold. And it, it, you know, again, it, it wasn't evolution that was going to take me away from him. It was naturalism. It was... It was that that non-spiritual approach to life and i can still tend to fall into those same traps i have to continually feed myself on um in jesus mm -hmm. in, in order to maintain that that life because my natural tendency is to go toward naturalism um, and even not necessarily think of god being involved in the natural processes. I, I think he is, but, but it's not first instinct always to, to think that. Um, and that's something that I have to work against. You talked about having these simple understandings or these, these simple pat answers and realizing, okay, here's somebody who's studied science all their life, and suddenly your answer seems really, really trite and insignificant. I had a conversation recently with somebody where they were bemoaning the fact that some of our conservative people are buying into the flat earth theory. This, this person I was speaking with was, was just wondering, how are these people believing this stuff? And somebody else brought up a really, I thought was a good point, and that is that we often as conservative people tend to, to view this Christian and science thing as two different things. Mm -hmm. And so if we as, as Christians reject evolution, subconsciously we're rejecting some of science. 
or, or scorning science, looking down on that some. This third individual was, was just saying that's how he believes we have conservative people who are, are falling for these other things because now we're pitting Christianity against science. And so the scientists are saying the earth is round. They're, they're also saying evolution. So we reject evolution. Why can't we reject anything the, else? Anything else. And that's really dangerous ground to be on. Mm -hmm. But then you just shared about being just immersed in that knowledge and that learning and that leading to places that, that maybe cause us to lose our faith, where we go from, from Christianity and, and scorning science to maybe the inverse, where we are really into science and, and are questioning Christianity. How do you balance those? My first allegiance has to be to the kingdom of God. And if that's the case, if, if I truly am first allied with him, then I'm going to, I'm going to um, approach everything I do in life with that uh, commitment, including science. Unfortunately, for a lot of us, we forget that that's our first commitment. I forget that it's my first commitment. And so I, I start committing to other things. I commit to being right, for example. I commit to um, my group getting being successful. Okay, so, so my congregation, I want my congregation to be successful. So I don't like when somebody leaves my congregation to go to a different one. Right. And, and that's not all of that is bad. But if I forget that my first commitment is to the kingdom of God, then I'm going to get, I'm going to lose my way in lots of other things, including in, in the study of science. We also, at the same time, have to recognize again, all truth is God's truth. And there's, there are things we can learn about reality, about the physical world from people who are not part of God's kingdom. It's lazy for us to simply accept or reject any of these ideas based on who thinks them to be the case. Now, going, going uh, to, the, to the flat earth question, um, a lot of conservative Anabaptists are sitting ducks for that kind of theory because we, um, we don't teach science well in our schools. And I, I'll admit that I don't teach it as well as I wish I did. Unfortunately, far too often what we do when we teach science is that we teach the findings of science. We, so science becomes a list of facts for you to memorize. Well, those facts are always changing. You know, fat is good for you. No, it's bad for you. Uh, no, it's good for you now. Um, and that can undermine our, our faith in the process of science. The coronavirus pandemic um, is sh giving us a front row seat into how science actually works. And with our just teaching the findings of science, instead of also alongside that teaching the process of science, how you go about asking questions, how you go about finding out answers to your questions, if we don't do that, our students see science really as just a question of authority. Who gets to say what's true? We don't trust them because they're not, they're not Christians. And they're setting themselves up as the authorities, so we reject them and we reject their findings. Science is not that way in reality. It's not a system by which you have authorities who get to say what's true and what isn't. Einstein was dead wrong about certain things. So just quoting Einstein to a scientist means nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's missing what the process is. And the process of science, in a nutshell, is that you, 
you uh, test hypotheses. You, you have ideas and you test your ideas. And in the testing process, you actually try to show that the idea is false. If you can't show that your idea is false, then you accept it as true until you can show that it's false. So circling back, we tend to be sitting ducks for um, the, the kinds of alternative theories like flat earth, like a lot of alternative medicines that, that don't work. Some alternative medicines do, but you have to take them on an individual approach or individual basis. Um, we're sitting ducks for those because we don't teach the findings very much. Um, a, lot of, a lot of conservative Anabaptist schools don't teach the findings of science, let alone the process. And so when somebody comes, comes along with some whiz-bang idea, we get taken up by it because they seem like a nice person um, or they seem like a believable person. They're projecting confidence and, and so on. Um, and, and we accept it. Also, um, the fact that something is outside the mainstream doesn't concern us at all because we're outside the mainstream. Mm -hmm. You know, most Christians would see conservative Anabaptists as kind of a side shoot, maybe a um, uh, an extreme version of Christianity or something. They see us as, as Christian extremists. And so it doesn't bother us at all that something is outside the mainstream of science because we ourselves are. We're almost... We almost have a culture of being countercultural. Yeah, right? right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And on top of that, a lot of these alternative theories like Flat Earth uh, form communities that are very similar to our communities. They know each other. Um, I, I was listening to um, an interview with one YouTuber with another. Uh, one was a Flat Earth YouTuber. And he his engagement with his audience was way higher than any other YouTuber can hope for, or most other YouTubers can hope for, because they're forming a community. We make a mistake, this, this is kind of an aside, but we make an, a mistake when we then try to, to just bring more facts to the, to the table. Um, when somebody believes in alternative theory and they're part of a community that believes that, bringing more facts just drives them further into their community and it doesn't actually change their minds. It, in fact, it can harden their minds. It can make them more convinced of the thing that they already thought, which is just mind-boggling until you realize that it actually works in us too. Um, anything that, any belief we have that's a part of our identity, and, and so we're you know, conservative and a Baptist, that's part of our identity. Any belief that we have that, that ties into our identity as a conservative and a Baptist, if someone were to bring more facts that would challenge um, our beliefs, it would just drive us further into uh, our conservative Anabaptist community. It would actually harden our beliefs. Uh, persecution did that in, in the early church. Now, persecution, uh, the, the blood of the martyrs being the seed of the church, that was, that was way more than just a strictly physical process. I mean, I think the, the, the Holy Spirit was blessing the church for its faithfulness. But you see that happening. As they got attacked harder, they became more staunch in their beliefs. Um, and the same thing is gonna happen if you try to, say, persecute by bringing all kinds of attacks on them, um, intellectual attacks. Uh, if we do that for alternative beliefs, it's just simply not going to work. If there are people listening or, or viewing this and they say, okay, I don't think I did have a great education in science growing up. I'm not sure how to think well about science. Maybe this episode is helping them in, in that regard, sort some of those things out. But do you have any practical tips or tools for people who want to think better about this? I don't know of any popular books uh, to recommend in that arena. Uh, that's the first, first place I go is you know some, some book to recommend. Um, I, I think that book needs to be written. A um, kind of a, a science for the masses book from a Christian perspective. Yeah. Uh, I there are a bunch of them from a secular perspective that would, um, they're meat, not milk. And so I, unfortunately, I don't know of, of books that I can offer um, 
for somebody to to just read and if if, if somebody knows of them i i would i would love to uh, see them i would say as a practical tip um the place to go is not where the loudest voices are there are youtube channels and organizations devoted to uh, debunking evolution that really just continue to feed into this idea that science is about authorities stating facts um, and that and that those if if an authority says it then it's true that's not an approach that you want to develop in yourself so as far as a, a practical tip for just developing a, a, a scientific mindset a truly scientific mindset which is that you you seek to know the truth based on the evidence is to just start asking the question how do you know mm. how do you know that that's true then yeah read it t- take a subject and read uh on that subject widely and deeply and as you learn more about something any subject whether it's backyard birds or or you know fish or or energy or whatever um, as you learn more about a subject you just start to imbibe the 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 process as well because you you learn how we know this so that's that would be i guess the uh, first order practical tip um that's that's a great question and one that i hope to develop better answers for over time um how do we move from this place where we're sitting ducks as a community to having the strong intellectual backing while maintaining our strong faith tradition um how how do we how do we get there mm-hmm. um that's a that's something that i think is going to take a lot of time it may take better science instruction in our schools uh and just more people becoming engaged with the question what i hear you saying here then is in some ways to get better at science we just need to do almost do more of it we need to uh read and and discover and as we do more of that we start understanding and internalizing how discovery actually happens and we can get better at at recognizing what somebody says and says well what was the process behind getting to that conclusion i can see this process of of learning to love the scientific process as maybe starting with one of those light bulb moments where you're just like wow they came up with this and here's how they got there that's really neat and then you want to continue doing that do you have any examples in closing here of where there's a fact and just the process of getting there you found really intriguing so in high school i learned that atoms are made of, that that everything is made of atoms and that um atoms have a, a a tiny nucleus that's where most of the mass is and that most of the atom is empty space and that outside the nucleus are these electrons that but but between the nucleus and the and the electrons is empty space and i never asked how did they know that but when i became a teacher i um i uh, taught this and and the process of how we got to know what an atom is like which you can't see you you can't see an individual atom how do we know what they're like one of the first questions was how do we know that there are atoms in the first place how do we know that there are individual particles that are moving around independent of each other and the answer to that is brownian motion you can actually see this in a microscope if you take pollen grains and put them on a on a little bit of water and then look at them you'll see them jiggling back and forth well if they're jiggling there's some force on them something that's moving them what's doing that well it turns out that it's actually the water molecules themselves are bouncing off that that uh, pollen grain and making it jiggle in place okay so now we know that that there are actually particles what are they like and 
there were a number of experiments in which uh, the conclusion was that you can separate them, separate things off of the particles, and they called them electrons, and and these things had charge on them, and and so they came up with a, an updated model of of the of what an atom is like, and then there was a, a, a guy who decided he's he's going to do some more experiments, and what he decided to do, he's going to take really thin gold foil, and he's going to sh- bombard it with alpha radiation, which is a really heavy particle, heavy in atomic sense, right? Um, but he's going to bombard this thin gold foil with, with these alpha particles and just see what happens. And what he was what he figured would happen was that these alpha particles would would deflect as they went through the gold foil. He imagined that what he was doing was taking a softball and throwing it through, say, tissue paper. And he just wanted to see how much does the softball deflect as it goes through the tissue paper. Well, to his surprise, he found that well, he had a detector actually all the way around this this setup. So he had the alpha particles coming out, hitting this this uh, gold foil and then deflecting. Okay, so it would, it would go somewhere and it would hit on this detector. Mm-hmm. To his surprise, he found that some of it would bounce back. It was very a very small percentage of them, but but a percentage of them would bounce backward. That would be like you throwing your softball at this uh, tissue paper sheet and finding that sometimes it bounces back. It was extra- extraordinarily surprising to him. So he had to update his model and, and discovered that that in fact... Um, most of the mass of the thing is that nucleus in the center. That's how the nucleus was discovered. And then, um, so that means then that the electrons are going around the atom and, or that they're, I, I shouldn't say they're going around the atom. They're, they're outside the nucleus. Okay, mm-hmm. there's some space there. And so we just imagined them as being like planets going around a, uh, the sun. Well, Niels Bohr came along and said, that doesn't make any sense because what would happen over time, because you have this force in the center pulling your electron in, is that if over time your electron would spiral in and hit the, hit the nucleus and, and it would destroy itself. Um, so what's going on? Um, and so then he came up with what we now call the Bohr model, which said that, that the electrons can only be at certain distances away from the nucleus. Um, of course, the the quantum model is is an update from that even, but we use the Bohr model to this day to predict most of the, the or to to do a lot of the chemistry that we that we do uh, to predict what kind of of um, product you'll get from from two reactants and so on. Um, but but the story makes the findings so much more interesting. We know this about mm-hmm. something we can't even see because. Because somebody asked a question and then didn't get um, didn't get thrown off by I mean he got surprised by mm-hmm. results but didn't give up mm-hmm. uh, didn't just throw his results away but actually continued to ask okay what's actually going on here and was was willing to reject the previous model and create a new one based on the evidence that that he saw a a willingness to to pursue things and really a curiosity when, wait, I wasn't expecting that, and then pushing in further until they did find, did find the answer. Well, thank you, John Mark, for your time today, and you've given us a lot of thought-provoking things on on how to maybe think more critically about science and care more about it in our own lives, and uh, a sense in you a, a passion here as you're doing that, and bless you on on the journey of continuing to learn yourself and instilling that love of learning and and critical thinking in your students as well. Thank you.